Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. My name's Ben Jakes Leslie. I'm the Agriculture Program Manager for JPAL. I've been working on the Agricultural Technology Adoption Initiative for about three and a half years. Um, and we're really just starting this sort of policy outreach piece of, uh, of our work because we've only now finished the, this policy lesson review. Um, but I'm really excited to talk to you guys. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So just to give you an overview of what we're gonna, what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna do a little bit, spend a little bit of time trying to set up both what ATI is and why we started ATI. Um, talk just a little bit about the background um, and then I'll go in briefly into how we develop these policy lessons to try to kind of speak to some of the questions that might come up about, about the difference between this and a systematic review um, and other questions because they're two very different things. And I think in some ways the goals are quite different between them as well. Um, and then after that, after all that set up, I'm actually going to go into a couple of uh, policy lessons. One on information, the, you know, what is the results on providing information through different techniques to farmers and, and what happens. And then I'll go into credit and risk mitigation. So different financial mechanisms um, and that, that help to uh, either provide access to credit to farmers or reduce the risk that they're exposed to. Um, so continuing on. So we started ATI based on a couple of different graphs and understanding of, of the world and agriculture. And so this here is the, so and these are both kind of examples that I think speak to the, this, the picture of agriculture around the world. So what we have here is cereal ye yields are in different parts of the world. So this pink line here is the US, this is uh, East, East Asia, this is the purple line is South Asia, and the bottom line is uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. From, this is yields from uh, 1961 through 2011. And as you can see very clearly that, you know, East Asian and U.S., um, and U.S. is sort of standing in for other developed countries, um, yields have grown kind of consistently over this time. And there has been yield growth in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia, but it's been much lower than, um, than other parts of the world. And so we wonder why, why is this happening? And so that brought us to this other graph. This is fertilizer use um, in the same parts of the world. And I think, I, again, I want you to think of fertilizer use as an example of a kind of technology, not, not that we only care about fertilizer. But I think there's, two, there's a lot of really interesting things here. Um, one, Afri sub Saharan Africa, obviously, the input use of fertilizer is extremely low. And I think this is consistent across other kinds of technologies. This is partly a supply chain issue. You know, new technologies aren't developed as frequently for Sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, and also just availability in the marketplace. So I think that like low level of usage explains a lot of you know why Africa doesn't see these 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 uh, productivity growth. Um, South Asia though is a very different story, especially for the level of productivity. It is the highest usage per hectare of of, of fertilizer. Um, and in fact, you know, you see in the U.S., we continue to have productivity growth, but the use of fertilizer has leveled off since the 1980s. So it's, it suggests that there are two different things going on in Sub-Saharan Africa and um, South Asia, but they're related. It's about the appropriateness of the technology for the given context, that farmers have a hard time adopting technologies that are correct for them or having technologies available at all. Um, so a little background on ATI. So ATI, uh, the Agricultural Technology Adoption Initiative, is a co-run initiative by the Poverty Action Lab at MIT and, and here, um, as well as the Center for Effective Global Action, which is a research center at UC Berkeley. We co-manage the, the, the initiative together. We have also have funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and DFID, as well as an anonymous donor. We fund RCTs and pilot projects by JPEL affiliates, um, SEGA affiliates, and invited researchers um, through a competitive process, uh, peer-reviewed proposals, and then are select selected to, um, to receive funding. So we focus on testing innovative strategies to try to increase the uptake of different kinds of technologies, in particular focusing on seven different constraint areas that we identified through a review paper. So these are credit market constraints, information inefficiencies, input output market inefficiencies, 
um, externalities, risk markets, labor markets, and land markets. And as you can see already, we're not, we don't have policy lessons for all these different things because in many areas there isn't enough research to even start thinking about how we bring these to policymakers. So we haven't even touched those areas. And just clarification, yep. these are mutually exclusive categories? No, no, not at all. No, no, a research project, as you can see, so like, yeah, I mean, these numbers don't sum up to 36. So we have 36 projects all around the world, and they can maybe uh, investigate multiple channels. Um, and most of the time they no, do. I meant the categories. I know that they don't add up, but credit market could be an input, but it's separate from an input as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think that there's some... Yes, you sometimes the way you define the technology, it can get a little bit fuzzy. Um, like we think about adoption of risk of like insurance, for example, mm -hmm. but really then it's like adoption of risk in order to change your behavior, the farmer's behavior in some way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, we have over 64 researchers on all of these projects, including, um, you know, Alain de Genvry, Elizabeth Satellet, uh, Michael Kramer, Tavneet Sori, Craig McIntosh, several, I was looking at some of your brochures, well, there's a huge overlap in, you know, the researchers we, we, uh, we, uh, we work with. Um, and it's quite similar to the um, agriculture innovation, um, inno innovation thematic window, um, as well as uh, SPIA's um, funding for CG, for G CG work. So just kind of talking a little bit about our process for how we developed these, um, how we developed these. And it's not, I'd say it is very different from the systematic review. Um, so the motivation was we believe that looking at the literature, there were emerging lessons in that and that we wanted to find a way to spark conversations with, um, with policymakers about what the literature says. So this is like a method, this is a guide for us in order to talk to policymakers. It's not designed for publication and saying, definitely do this policy, definitely do this scale up. This is a guide for us in talking to policymakers. So we didn't have a specific inclusion criteria, um, but what we did was as staff, we interviewed and had conversations with our board officers. So that's Rachel Glenister, Craig McIntosh, Tavneet Suri, and Chris Udry, and kind of collected from them papers that they thought were very important that had come up recently and you know throughout since you know over over time. And then on an ongoing basis, I, I kind of collected uh, new agriculture studies from top journals, from a working paper series, and also, you know, in conversations with the researchers, you know, when possible, tried to go find unpublished work that, you know, spoke to some of these issues that we were working on, we were thinking about. And then with these researchers, we um, we defined which which papers we would con we would consider in the development of the policy lessons. The vast majority of which are, are randomized control trials with the occasional natural experiment um, or uh, diff and diff. But you know, I'd say it's. 95% of the studies we're citing are, are going to be um, randomized control trials. Um, and so we worked with them to, to define these policy lessons and then at the end, the, the our, our, that group of academics all agreed on this set of policy lessons that we would use and start speaking to policymakers. Um, yeah, so continuing on. So now I'm actually gonna move in and start talking about the policy lessons given all of that. So. The first thing we'll talk, I'm going to talk about is information inefficiencies. So what, um, why might an information inefficiency reduce your uh, abili ability as a farmer to adopt a new kind of technology? So I think of this as the what, how, um, and why uh, list of technology. So you have to know what it is. You have to know that it actually exists. It's hard to adopt unknowns. Um, you have to know why to adopt it, what the costs and benefits are of that technology, and you have to know how to use it effectively. You have to have information in order to s specifically know how to use that technology. And this applies for you know, seed technology, for other kinds of inputs as well. Um, so what we find is that you know, many times there isn't information available on technologies, and at times when there is information available, it's incorrect, not applicable, or comes at the wrong time. So from looking at the literature, we come to these, um, these th three major points. The very first one 
is that, and this is sort of, I think this is related to the farmer field schools uh, review, but often general extension we find is not very effective in, in promoting ex a, uh, behavior change. And this is really based on uh, the RCTs that have looked at um, extension and provide ex like general extension services. Um, there's two, there aren't very many RCTs that look at this explicitly. Um, the two that we really look at is one by Esther DeFlo, Tapneet Sori, and Dan Keniston in Rwanda, where they, um, they did an RCT of farmer field schools for coffee farmers and found absolutely no effect on, farmers did not change their behavior in any way whatsoever. This is unpublished and, you know, because of zero results, <laughs> it's unlikely to actually move on to a working paper. Um, in another study, um, you know, the Esther and co-authors worked with, um, worked in Kenya to, um, to, uh, to help farmers improve use of fertilizer. So what they, what, they, what they found was that using test plots, um, this did not, test plots within villages did not change any farmer behavior as well. Um, so another reason that farmers might not listen to general extension is often the advice can be wrong. Um, in the same research study that Esther DeFlo did with co-authors, um, it was in the paper, The Rates of Return to Fertilizer, they found that the recommendations that the Kenyan Ministry of Agriculture had were non, not profitable for farmers under any condition. So it makes a lot of sense that a farmer would not choose to adopt a recommendation that was absolutely not profitable for them. Um, in other instances in uh, Indonesia, um, uh, 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 Rima Hanna and co-authors um, worked on a study with seaweed farmers and they found that the recommendations that the NGO that was working with the seaweed farmers was giving were also not profitable for farmers. Um, there are cases in which um, uh, information can have strong effects on farmers. You know, the, the local market is not connected to a larger market. Everybody, all the farmers have product at the same time, so the prices crash right when everybody's gonna sell. So if you give farmers a loan so they're not, they don't have to sell at that cheapest time, they can hold onto their grain and sell when the prices are higher. Um, this, this project was done with the provision of a kind of storage mechanism so, the, so that the grain could stay, could stay good. Um, now this is only, you know, this only works in these situations where um, credit, where the markets have these seasonal, seasonal price fluctuations, right? Um, so now I'm going to take a break and I'm going to show you a quick video that we, um, about a project that's looking at the sort of cross section, the crossover between credit and risk mitigation. J Palin IPA, translating research into action. Agriculture is a source of income for about half the population in Africa and it's a big proportion of GDP so it's a vital um, area for improvement. So we've seen big improvements in yields in many parts of the world largely as a result of farmers taking up new technologies, new improved seeds, new fertilizers. Sub-Saharan Africa see almost flat yield growth. There's been a lot of investment in producing new technologies for farmers in Africa, and yet we see quite low take-up rates, which may explain why we see that very flat profile in Africa. At one level, it doesn't explain it, because why aren't they taking up these, these technologies? We did an analysis of all the evidence out there and came up with a list of you know, the key possible constraints that farmers could be facing for why they weren't taking up those technologies. And then we're so systematically trying to do different evaluations that address those different barriers. So the EUI project was designed to investigate two branches of the, of the uh, concerns that farmers give us here in northern Ghana. Are they really unable to make investments that are profitable because they don't have money? or? Are they unable to make these investments because they're worried about risk? And so we wanted to test that. 
Now it was designed for northern Ghana and around the specific problems that northern Ghanaian farmers might face, but these two basic issues of capital constraints and worrying about uninsured risk are ubiquitous throughout uh, agricultural areas of poor countries. We worked with experts in the field and eventually with the Ghana Agricultural Insurance Program to develop a rainfall index insurance product. The idea of it was to provide an insurance product that would assure the farmers that in the case of a disaster, terrible rain or terrible flood, they'd be made whole again. The insurance gives the farmer the confidence to want to plant more because you see most of the farmers doing small-scale farming because they don't have the confidence, they don't know what will happen. That gradually would now move that farmer from a peasant farmer to a semi-commercial and then eventually to a commercial farmer who become an export commodity for the country. This project was designed to test the role of, of credit or access to capital and the role of risk and in insurance. So they took a group of farmers and randomly picked some to get access to capital. Another group was randomly chosen to get insurance. Another group got both, and a group was just the status quo. There's three main conclusions from that study. The first is that when they find it worthwhile for them to invest in their farms, farmers have ways to find the resources to make that possible. <laughs> Number two, it was mitigating the risk that made it more worthwhile for them to invest in their farm. Number three, the disappointing part of the study, is we don't have any good evidence that these additional investments that the farmers made on their farms yielded a high profit. And so that's precisely what motivated the DIRTS project. And so now we're looking at the next layer of constraints that farmers talk about. So the DIRTS project that we're developing now um, is to combine this rainfall index insurance with two other interventions that may help these farmers. Number one is assuring access to inputs and perhaps outputs at the right time um, and to make sure that the quality of those inputs are high. And second, providing a new form of extension advice to farmers to help them as they move into this new kind of production with their higher investment to make sure that they know the recommended techniques for using these new inputs. So I think that this, um, this project does a good job at showing us the connection between you know, risk, risk protection and um, credit and the, sort of the, the fact that the benefits from risk protection can be just as good as, as credit and uh, you know, ideally that is much more cost effective. In a way, this, sor this project is a bit of an outlier because in this case, they found quite high levels of, of adoption of insurance. In fact, it's the only project that I know of where, um, where insurance was adopted at a actuarially fair price. All other, pro all other uh, uh, research on whether index insurance has not produced um, adoption at any level that would mean that the product was financially st um, financially. Uh, possible. In fact, even in this study, it wasn't adopted at a market level. So we have two main pieces of, of thinking about protection of risk. One is that given all of the emphasis on microinsurance and of weather index insurance in agriculture, it, there are so many constraints on it that it's unlikely to be something that will quickly reduce the risk of many farmers. It's not been shown in any instance to be a, a really viable solution. But there are early results in risk mitigating crops that suggest that this might be a more promising way to protect risk. And I'll talk a little bit more about why um, weather index insurance it seems to be less, less good in some ways. So the first thing is often the high prices of insurance really reduce uh, uptake by uh, 
uptake by farmers. This is shown in, in studies by Sean Cole, by Dean Carlin, by Craig McIntosh, and by Mushfiq Mubarak. Um, cutting prices does increase the uptake, but of course, as you cut prices and in increase the uptake, then there's more risk on the, the part of the banks. Um, so there's, but there's several ways we can think of also improving uptake of, of these weather insurance programs. The first one that I'll talk about is, uh, tr is trust. So we think that you know trusting your the financial the financial provider uh, who 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 owns the insurance policy could be a big constraint. You know if you don't trust that they're going to actually pay you, why should you buy it? Um, and we find that in several cases, when you when insurance is provide is sold by a more trusted source, then uptake is higher. Um, this was in I think I don't know if you guys funded this study by Tsai and um, Alain de Genvry in China. Um, that found that, uh, no, this was an insurance product, okay. Um, so when, when people adopted the insurance and found that repayments actually happened, people were more likely to adopt later on. Um, Sean Cole did a study in Gujarat where um, they chose different types of agents and the trust, more trusted agents were more likely to show increased uh, adoption of fertilizer. Um, and back to the idea that you know, if you see a payment, you're more likely to buy in, in, uh, buy insurance. Sean Cole also found that in a in, in a similar study, a related study to that. Of course, one of the tricky things about that is in a normal year, you're not going to be paying out anything, so you can't like use that necessarily as a as a lever to get people to adopt um, to adopt insurance. Um, the results for uh, financial literacy also are similar, but you know. This is from examples in China and also in India and in Kenya, where you provide some more financial information to, uh, to farmers about the insurance products, and in it cr does increase uptake, but still not at a level that would make the, the program viable. Um, an important point is the idea of basis risk. This is the risk that you purchase the, uh, you purchase the insurance, but you don't actually receive a payout when you had a bad outcome. And this seems to be a large constraint for many farmers. There are instances when, the, when you've been we've been able to experiment with reducing that basis risk. Mushfiq Mubarak um, and Mark Rosenzweig did a study uh, here uh, where they used um, kind of informal insurance networks of different castes as a way to kind of, uh, as, a, as a proxy for better basis risk um, protection. And groups that were in those uh, cast groups had higher uptake of weather insurance than other groups. Um, but when insurance is actually taken up, we do see increased ex ex increased use of inputs, um, including you know different kinds of crops, higher risk, higher yielding crops, more fertilizers, all these different things. The thing that's kind of curious about that, and brings me to the next point about risk mitigating um, risk mitigating crops is structurally when you provide insurance, your actual food supply is going to become high of higher variation because, you know, because the farmer's income risk is protected, they can then take yield risk. And that's an issue you know, from the standpoint of food security potentially, but also for um, farm laborers who are not, don't have the benef benefit of weather index insurance. So you know, in a bad year, they aren't protected like the farmer is, and they, they have much lower incomes. However, risk mitigating crops seem to be much more promising. Um, they, you know, when they work properly, they provide the same kind of risk risk protection that insurance does. For it piles in extra um, investments, but um, but it protects that on the yield side. Um, so I'm going to show you another much quicker video. Um, on on a type of uh, on a type of risk mitigating crop that was developed by Erie that um, Alain de Jeanbri and Betty Satellet and Kyle Emmerich um, and Manzor Dar have been experimenting with. So this is just a video of of the of, of the a field example of how the crop performs.
So as you can see on, on their plot, they have quite a large difference in, um, in the levels of yield. And so um, there, this is going to be a very boring slide. I apologize. It's just going to be darkness. Um, I skip forward. Sorry. Hopefully that'll figure itself out. But so that so that was on the field on on the Aries field plot. Here we go. Um, told you it was boring. Um, so just look at me instead. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit more about what their experiments showed with this when they actually worked with farmers. So they've done a series of uh, about five different experiments with uh, drought resistant and flood resistant rices funded by Atai. So. Um, the first thing was that they actually, uh, they, um, the first thing they did was they just gave away mini kits, uh, little starter kits of this seed um, to uh, 64 treatment villages 60 and didn't give them to 64 control villages. Um, and what they found was that there was flooding that occurred. So one of the things you have to, if you're going to do this type of uh, project, you're kind of hoping for some flooding so you can see if this is effective or not. So there was flooding. And the results were that it actually did perform. So they showed that this was actually a good technology when farmers are using it. Um, in particular, because lower caste um, or more marginal uh, groups were pushed onto less productive land that tended to flood more, it had equity impacts too. So poorer farmers benefited more from this seed than wealthier farmers, which was very exciting. Um, in the second year, they looked at the the sort of input decisions that farmers made based on this experience with the crop in the previous year. And so they shifted more, they shifted away from traditional risk protecting uh, crops. They um, used more fertilizer, they used more credit. Um, they also did more labor intensive planting because they could trust what the seed was going to do. And they found that, um, that on farm plots yielded 36, the treatment group yielded 36% more uh, of the crop. So then, so the, the issue with this is, is like giving away free mini kits is not exactly completely scalable. So we need it, they're now working on different ways to try to improve distribution of this seed. So in one experiment, they did door to door sales and compared that to other villages where they just let the social network in the kind of distribute the seeds themselves. And they found a huge difference uh, between door to door sales and using the social network. So as much as 8% more people adopted through the social network versus 40% from door-to-door -door sales. So that's huge and you know, I think that makes a lot of sense. And the majority of the adoption through the social network was of people with the same last name as the farmers who had the mini kits. So now they're doing a couple of new experiments. One focused on this distribution idea, trying to identify which people in a community are you know, likely to to be the good starting points for distribution within a community. So they're experimenting with identifying um, ward, le ward, um, ward leaders and people in village self-help groups and at village meetings. They're also doing an experiment to look at the impacts, not now moving away from yields, but impacts on uh, water markets and on labor markets. So just to, just to finish up, um, so I, I don't know what all of this kind of tells us together, um, I sort of think the major thing is that we need to think a lot more when we design these interventions from the perspective of, of the farmer. Um, you know, that you need to make the information actionable and timely for farmers, that the terms of credit have to be in such a way that if they actually look good to the farmer. Um, and for risk, I think farmers have shown that they're not willing to buy insurance at the levels that it's currently been offered. And if, and, but protecting risk can be a very important way to increase adoption, increase yields. Um, so these sort of, these risk mitigating crops can be a really useful tool for that. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't run too much over. I might have a little bit, but I apologize. So um, I've, uh, I've had a good time talking to you about this. And I think this, again, these lessons are meant as like a bridge and a way to begin conversations between researchers and policymakers. They're a guide for us to try to help help have those conversations. Um, and so that's, that's all we have. So thank you for listening to me.